Our scripture for today is from Luke's gospel. We've been working our way through Luke today. We're in Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 45, as we continue to learn from this deep, deep chapter in Luke's gospel, chapter 9. Hear now God's word. Now it came to pass on the next day, this is the day after the transfiguration on the mountain. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him, met Jesus. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he's my one and only. And behold, a spirit seizes him and he, he suddenly screams and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it mauls him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and to put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were amazed at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be handed over, that is betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this word and it was veiled from them so they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Don't be afraid to ask questions. As you know, and I've been sharing with you over the last three months in regular contact with uh, my brothers, my friends, and our mission partners with CMJ Israel. CMJ, I'll let you know, has actually about 220 staff members. That's, the numbers are quite large, not only because of the mission and ministry in Tel Aviv, Yaffa, in Jerusalem, and in the north, and the Galilee region, but also because of the school, the Christian school that's right there in the middle of the old city of Jerusalem, generally considered by internationals to be the best school uh, in Jerusalem. Um, primary and secondary school, it's a great school. I mean, Muslim folks, uh, Jewish folks, all kinds of people want their kids to go to this school. So there's about 220 staff members all told. Well, that number then correlates to the fact that just over 30 of the staff members or immediate children of staff members are currently deployed in the war going on in Israel and the Middle East. I mean, think about that, <laughs> just over 30 staff members and some of those adult children of staff members are in harm's way directly in the war right now. Some are serving in Gaza. Some are in Khan Yunus right now. You may be keeping up with the news. Uh, some are in what they would call, what Israelis would call uh, Judea and Samaria, what the West typically would call the West Bank. And some are in northern Israel near the borders with uh, Lebanon and Syria. Uh, the housekeeper where Nancy and I stayed, right there in the, the old city of Jerusalem, there at Christ Church, a lovely lady. She has two sons, two children, and they're both sons, they're both boys. They're both deployed right now uh, in, uh, in the war. And one of them serves in the Boaz Ford Tank Division. I mean, that's high level intensity. Daryl Fenton and I have talked about and prayed about over the last several months this heavy cloud that is over the people in Israel right now. All kinds of questions, concerns, and really a sense of foreboding, a truly an existential threat. We kind of bandy that term around a lot in American politics and news guys who are in podcasts who are not in a war right now, but these guys really are dealing with an existential threat. 
and everyone's foundation has been shaken. And that includes the Jewish believers who form the core of CMJ Israel and Christ Church. Um, that includes folks who are not believers in Jesus or Yeshua as the Messiah. You know, Jewish people, secular Jews, Orthodox Jews, Palestinian Arabs um, who are Muslim, Palestinians who are believers in Jesus. Some of the questions, some of the prayers that come out of this are really biblically oriented, you know, like the Psalms. Oh God, what are you doing in Israel? What, what, what are you doing through this? What are you going to do through this? And certainly for those who have sons involved in the most intense exploration and danger in the Gaza tunnels, what are you doing in those Gaza tunnels right now? Certainly for a, parents who have children, maybe children who have parents who are held as hostages right now in the Gaza tunnels. What, what are you doing there, God? What's, what's going on? One of uh, my dear colleagues, uh, man, we, Nancy and I were able to spend a couple days with in Jerusalem. He's, if you looked at the video that was posted of, it's one of the services that I preached at, at Christ Church. It's the one that was at the evening. You'll notice there's several pastors with me. One of those pastors, he has two sons. He and his wife have two sons. The younger son, who is a teenager, has a debilitating disease. He's probably going to die uh, in, you know, in the next several years. I mean, he's, he's not long for this world. They have an older son, though, named Micah, who's strong, smart, healthy. You know, he's kind of the future for the family, so to speak, on the ground level. He's the, he's the one who will get married, God willing, have the grandchildren, God willing. Uh, but Micah serves in the Nakal Brigade of the IDF. If you know the Nakal Brigade, you know they're heavily involved in combat, have been off and on for the last uh, three months. In fact, their, their, their high-level commander, the, the colonel of the Nakal Brigade, was killed the day after the October 7th attacks on October 8th uh, by Hamas uh, uh, militants when he went to begin the, the response to try to capture and you know, retrieve some of the hostages. So the Nakal Brigade has is, is continually been involved in combat, and Micah is part of the Nakal Brigade. I mean, these, these guys have, this pastor that I served with, <laughs> they had two sons, one who's got a debilitating disease that they have to cry about and pray about to God all the time, and then the one healthy one is in harm's way, seriously. Four weeks ago, Micah and his team were moving through Hamas tunnels in northern Gaza when they were struck by a rocket, a type that the IDF had not encountered before and was not in full mode to defend against. This rocket uh, did not injure Micah, but his battalion commander, Major Mordecai, was killed, along with a couple of Micah's best friends who were a few feet away from Micah when the rocket hit. The IDF investigated and found out, actually, this was a rocket produced by the People's Republic of China, which was new to them. You know, you ask this, like, how, how is Hamas getting uh, new rockets from the People's Republic of China? But, you know, this is all part of that whole Russia, Iran, China axis. So Micah survived. His battalion commander's killed. A couple of his best friends are killed near him. And the parents are back in Jerusalem. Now, this is a pastor. This is a really strong Christian, but <laughs> he's rending his heart before God with a whole lot of questions and saying, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to relate to God coming up if, if my son, my, my one healthy son, is killed right now. I mean, he's being openly honest. This, you can critique that if you want to, but if you put yourself a little bit into his shoes, you can see it's, it's an emotional struggle. Now, what I want to bring to us today is this invitation and really command from God's Word. Don't avoid raising questions about God to God. Don't avoid raising your questions about God to God. And let me tell you the other side of this coin. Don't take your questions about God to other people before going first and foremost to God. If you want to talk about God and what God is doing, you take that to God. Not some pundit who's on some show you like to watch. I mean, I'm talking about God. And you bring these questions to him 
in several ways. First of all, in open, honest prayer about where you are and the questions that you have. You do it, secondly, by seeking his word. Your prayer should be shaped and guided in your conversation with God to be guided by God's word. And then part of that, seeking godly counsel. The truth is you probably could use a little bit of help of how to you know, navigate through what is happening in your life, in your family's life. What is God saying? What is God not saying? What does God, God's word mean about this? This is really relevant to all of us, including those of us who are parents and grandparents nowadays or who have any kind of family members who are younger. Because in 21st century America, sorry to be the bearer of bad news today, but it's a reality that we have to deal with. 40 to 50% over the last couple decades of active church members' children who grew up in evangelical churches, children who grew up in, I'm not talking about kind of liberal mainline churches, I'm talking about evangelical churches that hold at, at least at some level to the idea that this is God's word and Jesus is the one true savior. 40, 40 to going on now 50% of children who grow up active in those kind of churches, in this kind of church, um, in church youth groups, have, by the time they are young adults, drifted away from active faith in God and from Christian community, active engagement in, in, in a real church. This departure from active faith by church family children as they become young adults is trending up, not downward, as we move through the 21st century. Definitely the case with Gen Z, Okay, folks who are like senior high through college age through 20-somethings right now. And experts are already projecting it based on current analysis and profiles and a lot of counseling with a Gen Alpha. At least when you're looking at middle schoolers and upper elementary kids and family track patterns. And that's Gen Alpha. That's the next gen coming up. The way our youth group works right now is like middle school is Gen Alpha. Um, High school is the tail end of Gen Z. Because both these generations, and definitely Gen Alpha, but I mean, frankly, Gen Z, um, raised on screens, digital screens, their whole lives now, as pacifiers. This is their pacifier. You know, you got to look at that. And as their security blanket and as their babysitter. I mean, this is the way most parents in America now raise their kids, with screens as pacifiers, babysitters, and with social media as the true mother's milk of our children and our youth and our young adults. The source of identity, security, connection with friends. The worldview, it's not so much what do you think mom, it's more like what does the social media tell me and people I think I can connect with. This is where I find my identity, my belonging, my purpose. Uh, as Christian Smith says, and. He's part of the team with, from Fuller Youth Institute, from the Fuller Seminary, Sticky Faith for Your Kids. He says, when it comes to kids' faith, parents get what they are. When it comes to kids' faith, parents get what they are. In other words, it's not just you become what you worship. And if you worship sports and stuff and, you know, uh, politics and all this, you're going to get kids who, who, <laughs> who, who spin out the same way. It's just uh, not only who you are, but who your kids are going to be. And, and you can say all the right words, and you can quote from the Bible occasionally, but, you know, kids know what your real religion is and what your real purpose statement is and where you get your passion and how you spend your weekends and what you get excited about. I mean, your real religion and your real idols or gods come through. And so Smith says when it comes to kids' faith, parents get what they are. The Fuller Youth Institute has done a whole lot of study on the difference and the conflict between the agenda to form good kids versus forming Christ-following character in young adults. I mean, that is a major difference. I, I want you to look good and do the right things and, and be on track and fit in. And by the way, when we go to church, you just need to make sure you do the right ritual kind of things right now. Or are we looking at forming character that is Christ-following of people who are gonna be actual young disciples? adult disciples of Jesus. Youth ministers report 
challenges over and over again from parents' agenda and pressure to help our kids be nice, virgin, and poised for success in the world out there. I mean, these are people who come to churches and to evangelical churches. There's a lot of, that's kind of the, the agenda with a lot of parents, unfortunately. I don't think so much here, but I can just tell you that rubs into the world we're in. In this book that I picked up last week that just got published about three months ago, Faith Beyond Youth Group by Powell Griffin and Bradbury, also from the Fuller Youth Institute. Uh, the whole idea is, in other words, faith beyond the 75 to 90 minutes a teenager spends in a youth group. Or conversely, faith beyond the 60 to 75 minutes teenagers or adults spend in a worship service. In other words, faith in the rest of your life and with the rest of your life. One of the challenges we face now is that 70% of youth, according to the Fuller Youth Institute that they study, evangelical churches now, 70% of U.S. youth active in youth groups in evangelical churches report having significant doubts about faith, God, and Bible. So the question is, what are we going to do about that? Well, we can hide it under the rug or not deal with it. We can avoid it and deny it. Or we can do what the Bible invites us to do, which is be honest to God, right? Unfortunately, many parents who are not sure about their own faith and who aren't grounded in the Bible and in regular, you know, true godly guidance, and a whole lot of youth ministries, not here, and I give thanks for Kirk and Faith and Reed previously, and then now certainly Dean and now Boston helping out too. You know, we've got youth ministry commitment to engage youth in their questions, but many parents in many youth ministries have no time or capacity to hear and discuss their kids' questions or doubts, or to provide sound shepherding in response to those questions and those identity crises, which we're seeing more and more of. It's not just a question, it's an entire identity crisis going on. And that is on steroids now with what the Fuller Institute calls the anxious, adaptive, and diverse Gen Z. It's anxious, you know, anxiety is through the roof now, okay? Adaptive and diverse. And Gen Alpha is gonna definitely be that way. So God's word is telling us today, don't be afraid to ask or to hear questions, okay? Parents, don't be afraid to hear questions and doubts. Don't be afraid to discuss them. It's gonna grow your faith if you do. We can resource you, that's what we're here for, right? And remember, now if you've come to me for counseling or if you've come to me about maybe your own children and, and asked for you know, pastoral advice, remember what I've told you, and it's what I learned when I was a, in clinical pastoral ministry at the VA, when I was going through seminary. My presbytery made me do this, it's good stuff. Didn't want to have to do it at the time. But um, remember, a presenting question always has a question or question behind it, underneath it, and before it. In other words, what's going to happen if this answer comes this way? Okay? So it's, the presenting question is typically not the real question. And the real questions with teenagers are typically going to go to those things I've talked with you about before. You know, identity, community, and purpose. So just remember that parents get equipped in this uh, when you in, be equipped in not just your favorite three verses from the Bible. Sometimes your favorite three verses from the Bible are not going to provide the whole answer here, okay? Now, let's go to scripture today, our key scripture. Remember where we are in Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through our passage for today, verse 45. We're talking about Jesus' upside-down gospel, and yet in the midst of his upside-down gospel is divine glory. We looked at, uh, for several weeks, verses 18 through 26, when Jesus calls his disciples away and asks them, who do you say that I am, and then tells them the first huge full-scale direct prophecy of his upcoming crucifixion and resurrection. And the message here was the Messiah, okay, Peter, you're going to proclaim me as the Christ? Well, you have to understand the Christ is the suffering king who must die. That does not compute. That didn't compute to those guys then. It really still doesn't compute to us necessarily easily now. And following him, 
Well, that's going to mean going the way of the cross. Wait a minute, it's not just you, Jesus, going the way of the cross? No, he says, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and follow me too. Wait a minute, that's not what I heard in most churches. I know, but that's the, I'm talking about Jesus, not the kind of watered-down stuff that you get from some people. And this is, a, this is a head scratcher. This is challenging, right? This is questioning stuff. Then the past two Sundays, we've been looking at the transfiguration account in Luke and the message from God that Jesus alone is God's son, yet his glory comes in the exodus, the crucifixion and the resurrection. He's talking about with Moses and Elijah, the fact that he's going to have to be the Passover lamb ultimately. If you miss those, um, and the message on Jesus' divine authority, you can go back and listen to the sermons from January 21st and January 28th. Heaven on earth, definitely want to hit that one, and am I saved? If you're, not, if you're not clear on what salvation is in Jesus, ask Jesus, not friends. But that ask Jesus, not friends, leads us into where we are today in chapter 9, picking up at verse 37 and moving forward. And we're dealing here with the descent from divine heavenly majesty, Jesus' descent from that, to going down to the level of where we are, human disbelief and demonic mayhem. Now, verses 37 through 39, a large crowd meets Jesus, and a man from the crowd cries out, because does he have incredible faith? No, he's just desperate, okay? This is the way parents get, right? He's desperate. Father of a boy abused by an unclean spirit says, teacher, I beg you, Look at my son, and he uses high language for son, Guion, which means like my heir. Okay, this is the future of the family. I beg you, look at my son, because why? Because he is my one and only. I know the ESV doesn't translate it that way. I gave you that because I want you to understand, monogonase, it's the same term that's used in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his monogonase, his one and only son. So this is a big deal. We're, I think we're supposed to catch this. And behold, a spirit seizes him. So let's see what's going on here. You've got an entire crowd that's interested in the big display, but you've got one man who's willing to step out and talk to Jesus and ask questions and ask for help. Okay, that's, so what does he do? One man from the crowd steps out and does what? Ask Jesus for help. You can fill in the blank if you're following the sermon notes so you can kind of remember what we're talking about here. Regarding the man's greatest needs, and the man's burning questions. Because you know he's got a lot of questions about what's going on with his son. How is his son possessed by this devil, this demon? What's going on? Where's God in this? And we need to do the same. Step out. This is what I want to invite you to do today. Step out from the crowd. Step out from what everybody else is saying on social media. Step out from the folks you hang out with. Step out from the guys you play golf with. Step out from the, the, the women you're going on the shopping trip with and actually talk to God. Okay. Step out and ask Jesus himself about your burning needs and questions. The man is kind of breathless. He's going, I, be, I begged your disciples. He goes all the way through all the stuff that's going on with his son. He says, um, I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answers, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and to bear with you? Now, bring your son here. What are we talking about? What's Jesus talking about? The faithless and twisted generation. Notice this. The faithless and twisted generation includes whom? A couple different people. Can you fill in the blanks? It includes clearly the disciples, his own disciples, and also notice this, the Father himself. Let me take you over to, I'm not going to do a whole lot with the other, uh, the parallel passages, so to speak, in Mark and Matthew, but I'm going to go there a couple times, and here's one, Mark 9, verses 22 through 24. The father closes his breathless appeal to Jesus and says, Mark gives us this, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I know you're a miracle worker. Somehow, maybe you can help out. And Jesus calls him to himself. You have to understand this. Jesus calls him to himself and says, Jesus said to him, if you can, do you have any idea to whom you're speaking? <laughs> if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. 
Now, I know about four years ago when I preached through Mark, I've got a sermon on this, so you can go back and find that in the archives. That's a whole sermon unto itself, but that's the way when we have doubts and when our children have doubts, that's the way we need to come. I believe, help my unbelief. Moving on, verses 42 and 43. Jesus rebukes the demon, just like he previously in 9 rebuked his disciples when they're calling him the Christ but have no idea what they're talking about and don't need to go off like publicizing their confusion. Jesus rebukes the demon and gives the only son, catch this, this is prophetic, gives the only son back to the father. The crowds are amazed. What a great miracle. This is awesome. Is this the height of kingdom glory? No. And Jesus is there to teach his disciples then, and he will teach you now if you will turn to him. The big show and the miracles and, oh gosh, she got healed. I mean, that's awesome. That's from God, but that's not the, the deep center of the story. Notice this. What does Jesus say to them? He gives the second prophecy of his coming sacrificial death for us. And he gets even more specific here in Luke. Luke does not give us quite as much of the prophecy as Matthew and Mark do, but Luke hones in on something that's very specific, and it's an incredible prophecy. Jesus now hones in on what's going to happen to him, and he says, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. That's the term that's used there. So let's talk about what's, what's happening here. The disciples' faith deficit and dysfunction. Sometimes our faith deficit and dysfunction, right? Three things we can pull together from the three accounts. Puny faith. Oh, you of little faith. That's in Matthew 17. Oh, you of little faith. They have a little bit of faith, but it's puny. What's your faith looking like lately? Big? Puny. You may want to talk to Jesus about that and ask for some serious help by the Spirit, right? Secondly, prayerlessness. That's what we get from Mark's. Remember, after Jesus has performed the miracle in Mark's gospel, Mark adds and notes to us that they came to him afterwards and said, why couldn't we do it? And he says, this requires much prayer. And they could probably sit there and say, well, we prayed a lot. We say the standard prayers and everything. And Jesus is like, no, I mean real prayer. What's your prayer life like? Parents, if you've got kids going through teenagehood, your prayer life better be really deep. If it's not, let me give you a wake-up call today, okay? And then fear of asking Jesus. This is Luke. Luke's honing us in on this. Fear of asking Jesus about his hard sayings on God's word and will for Jesus, but not just Jesus, for his disciples. And that means them and means us. So Jesus says, look, the, the, the miracle is not the big deal. Let, 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 let me get this really clear with you guys. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be handed over or betrayed. Paradidomai means to hand over in the sense of betrayal. It's the same term the gospel writers use when they're talking about what Judas does. But they did not understand this word, rhema in the Greek. Okay? I know the ESV doesn't give you that. I'm telling you, it's a it's word, and this means a prophecy. They did not understand this powerful prophecy that Jesus is giving to them and what that means for him and for them. And it was veiled from them, and they were afraid to ask him about this word. Now, notice there's a dance going on here. Which one is it? It's both. It's veiled from them, but it's veiled from them in part in the dance because they're not asking. Like if something is veiled for you, what you, should you do? You should what? Ask about it. And they don't. I don't want to leave you where the disciples are left on that side of the cross in the resurrection. You're called in Jesus Christ. He's not the victim, he's the victor. And he will equip you not to be victims, but to be victors. So turn to him. Call out his name. Call to him. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid if your children ask questions. Invite a living communion with God. Questions, doubts, bring them honestly to God. Bring them to God. Bring them to Jesus. Be open and honest in prayer. Seek his word and seek godly counsel. And may it be that you and I and that our children of this church 
know how to talk to God when they come to the key decisions in their lives and the points at which it's easy because the crowd is fading away from Jesus. It's easy because the person that they're thinking about marrying doesn't like Jesus or says he likes Jesus but won't fellowship with him in regular church engagement and regular mission. May it be that you and I are faithful now for what is before us, that even when some betray, ours will hold fast to the end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.